So my name is John Malcolm, and I am the chairman of the Criminal Law Practice Group. Uh, and I welcome you all here to our, uh, our breakout session. Uh, pleased to see such a packed uh, room. Uh, by dint of that, I would uh, assume that many of you have an interest in criminal law. We have a very active practice group. We host a lot of events in Telefora. We have our own uh, Facebook page. And I will be around for the rest of the convention. So if any of you are interested in finding out more information about our practice group or are interested in getting involved uh, in the group, please come up to me and, uh, and let me know of your interest, and I'll be sure to follow up uh, with you. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to uh, bring up our moderator, uh, Fifth Circuit Judge Kurt Engelhardt, and we'll kick off our program. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and welcome to the session on, it's entitled, The, the Wisdom and Law, I'm sorry. <laughs> Looking at the wrong thing here. Sanctuary cities, right? In a victory for the state of Texas, my court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, last year vacated almost all of a preliminary injunction issued by a district court that was preventing the Lone Star State from enforcing a state law directed to sanctuary cities, such as Austin, the state's capital. Texas argued, among other things, that sanctuary policies allow, quote, dangerous criminals back into our communities to possibly commit more crimes. To stop Texas from becoming a sanctuary for criminal aliens, the state legislature passed a law that required local governments to comply with federal immigration law. That included Title VIII, United States Code, Section 1373, which we'll discuss in further detail, and which forbids state and local governments from preventing their officials from sending, from sending information to the federal government on illegal aliens who have been arrested or otherwise detained. In fact, the state law requires city and county officials to assist federal immigration agents in their enforcement efforts and, and most importantly, to comply with, honor, and fulfill any detainer requests made by the federal government. Local sheriffs and city police departments that fail to honor federal detainer warrants, which are requests issued by federal immigration authorities to hold illegal aliens for pickup, are therefore in violation of state law. Texas law enforcement officials can also be charged with criminal misdemeanors for failing to honor detainer warrants, and the state attorney general can file a petition with the state court to remove them, remove them from office. I gotta get this microphone in the right spot. <laughs> Pardon me. Maybe that'll work. The Texas statute imposes a civil penalty on sanctuary cities of up to $25,500 for each day they intentionally violated the law. Only two days before the law was scheduled to take effect on September 1st of 2017, a federal district judge issued a preliminary injunction stopping Texas from enforcing the most important provisions of the law. That injunction was vacated by a three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit in an 18-page opinion written by my colleague, Judge Edith Jones. The panel dissolved all of the injunction except for a very minor provision. This case and others like it uh, are what areas of the law, uh, question what areas of the law the states and the federal government share responsibility. This issue is not new. Section 8.4 of Article I gives Congress exclusive authority to, quote, establish a uniform rule of naturalization, just as Section 8 gives Congress the exclusive authority to establish and collect all imposts and excises or tariffs. In 1832, President Andrew Jackson faced the nullification crisis in which Vice President John Calhoun, South Carolina, and other states maintained that they had the final authority to declare federal laws unconstitutional and thus null and void within each state. Jackson considered this unconstitutional, claimed it to be, quote, an abominable doctrine and that it would, quote, dissolve the union. Undeterred, the nullifiers took control of the South Carolina government in 1832 and passed what is known as the Ordinance of Nullification. Now, President Jackson responded by issuing a nullification proclamation in December of 1832, and the showdown was on. 
the proclamation stated that the nullification was, quote, incompatible with the existence of the Union, contradicted expressly by the letter of the Constitution, unauthorized by its spirit, inconsistent with every principle on which it was founded, and destructive of the great object for which it was formed. Of course, that crisis was resolved by a compromise on tariffs in 1833, which compromise also gave the president the power to use state militias and federal forces against the nullifiers. I might also add parenthetically, I recently came across uh, one of the many Ken Burns documentaries on prohibition. Uh, and the middle of the three episodes, uh, three sections on, on prohibition is called A Nation of Scuff Laws. So we're here today to discuss whether sanctuary cities make us a nation of scuff laws or whether uh, they are a true exercise of federalism in the most raw form. With this backdrop, we'll discuss those concepts and the practicalities of sanctuary cities in this country. We have a very esteemed uh, panel here to discuss these issues, and I've enjoyed working with them, and I know you're going to enjoy very much hearing from each of them. Uh, their bios are on the app. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and cover some of the highlights here for each. If I covered all of their many qualifications, we wouldn't have time for the program. First, my colleague from the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Stefanos Bibas, was nominated to that court by President Trump on June 19, 2017, and officially joined that court in November 2017. He received his bachelor's from Columbia University and Oxford and is a 1994 graduate of Yale Law School. I'm proud to state that he served as a clerk in the Fifth Circuit under my colleague, Judge Patrick Higginbotham, then entered private practice here in Washington, D.C., before clerking for Justice Anthony Kennedy in the 1997-98 term. He served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York and as a professor of law at the University of Iowa, University of Chicago, and University of Pennsylvania. At Penn, Judge Bibas directed the Supreme Court Clinic, for which he litigated a wide range of appellate cases under consideration before the U.S. Supreme Court and personally argued at least six of those prior to taking the bench. Uh, professor Ilya Soman is a professor of law at George Mason University and focuses on constitutional law, property law, and the study of po uh, popular political participation and its implications for constitutional democracy. His work has appeared in numerous scholarly journals and law review publications, as well as popular press outlets. He has testified before Congress on multiple occasions and is a regular contributor to the Volokh Conspiracy blog. Professor Soman earned his bachelor's with honors at Amherst College, a master's in political science from Harvard University, and his law degree from Yale Law School. He has published two books, one called Democracy and Political Ignorance, What Why Smaller Government is smarter, and another by the name of The Grasping Hand, Kilo versus the City of New London and the Limits of Eminent Domain. He will be a visiting scholar at the Georgetown Center for the Constitution during the spring 2020 semester. I'm also proud to say that in 2001 and 2002, he clerked for my other colleague on the Fifth Circuit, Judge Jerry Smith. Next, of course, uh, is former Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Before becoming the, the 84th United States Attorney General in 2017, Jeff Sessions served in the United States Senate beginning in 1996 and was reelected in 2002, 2008, and 2014 from the state of Alabama. What you may not know is that Jeff Sessions became an Eagle Scout in 1964 and also earned the Distinguished Eagle Scout Award for his many years of service. He is a graduate of Huntington College in Montgomery, Alabama, and received his law degree from the University of Alabama School of Law in 1973. After private practice in Russellville and later Mobile, Alabama, during which time he served in, as a captain in the Army Reserve in the 1970s, Jeff Sessions was named United States Attorney for the Southern District of Alabama, a position he, has held, he held for 12 years under Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush. He was elected Attorney General of the State of Alabama in 1994, a post he filled until his election to the U.S. Senate. Mark Fleming is the Associate Director of the National Immigrant Justice Center's Federal Litigation Project. Mark focuses on strategic litigation and public policy related to immigration enforcement and detention. 
NIJC's work on enforcement issues was recognized with the 2014 Daniel Levy Award of the National Immigration Project. Prior to joining the NIJC, Mark was the staff attorney at the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights focused on migrants' rights in the Western Hemisphere. In that capacity, he coordinated the Inter-American Commission's investigation into human rights concerns with the uh, U.S. immigration enforcement and detention policies, as well as detention's impact on due process. Mark graduated magna cum laude from Georgetown University Law, Law Center in 2006. While in law school, he worked on a host of immigrants' rights projects, including representing asylum seekers and coordinating a fact-finding mission to Ecuador to investigate the impacts of changes to immigration law on Colombian refugees. Mr. Christopher Hajek is the Director of Litigation at the Immigration Reform Law Institute, or IRLI. He received his law degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, an undergraduate degree with honors from the University of Michigan. He also has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Miami and studied philosophy and sociology at Oxford University. Chris was an officer in the Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps before joining the Center for Individual Rights where he litigated a string of high profile cases including the defense of videographer James O'Keefe in suits brought by former ACORN employees. A class action suit on behalf of Asian American students discriminated against by the New York City Public Schools and a case that resulted in the, in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals striking down Texas psychologists licensing statute as an overbroad restriction on free speech. The public interest litigation he handles at IRLI focuses on constitutional and other civil rights law in public interest with focus on the adverse effects of illegal and excessive legal immigration on American jobs and communities. So our program will begin with each of our speakers making an opening statement of about seven minutes in length. Following each of the speakers' presentations, we'll give each one a chance to respond to anything that any of the other panelists may have said. Uh, we will also have some questions that we have prepared for the panel to respond to, but we will be taking questions, of course, from all of you, so get your questions ready. Uh, we've got a great panel, and I know that uh, they're going to be able to handle all of the important issues that you might raise with them. So at this point, Judge Beavis. Thank you, Judge Engelhart. Thank you, all of you. Um, so this is a new set of conflicts. For a very long time, we have assumed that immigration is a federal power and federal realm, and also that historically criminal justice is a local or, dem or, or, or state matter. See United States versus Lopez. In the 1980s, if not before, the Immigration and Naturalization Service began seeking criminal enforcement by sending agents, now ICE agents, into jails to interview prisoners about their immigration status. And over the last few decades, a field of crimigration has grown up at the intersection of criminal prosecutions and convictions and the immigration consequences that are connected to them. So you have a clash or an intersection between a traditionally federal area and a traditionally state and local area, and a series of unresolved questions about what happens at that fault line. Uh, there are several laws that are in play here that our panelists are going to talk about. The first of these is 8 U.S. Code 1373. It's an unusual statute that mandates that a federal, state, or local government entity may not forbid or restrict any government agent or official from sharing citizenship or immigration information with the Immigration Naturalization Service, now Homeland Security. And there's an executive order that the current administration promulgated, Executive Order 13768, that sought to implement 8 U.S.C. 1373 by attaching uh, conditions and saying if you do not, uh, if, if you fail to provide all of this information, if you get in the way of sharing this information, we will restrict your access to certain government grants. Uh, and all of the district courts that have considered Executive Order 13768, to my knowledge, 
uh, have found the executive order unconstitutional, uh, either because it's not unambiguously clear or because it's coercive or under an anti-commandeering principle. A second place on this fault line is the Department of Justice policy to add three new conditions to the, the Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grants. A lot of money comes from the federal government to assist state and local criminal law enforcement. And they added con conditions that said, for you to get this money that was authorized by Congress, you've got to certify you're complying with Section 1373, you've got to permit Homeland Security personnel to access any detention facility to come in and interview the inmates about their citizenship and immigration status, and give at least 48 hours advance notice to DHS of, of the release date and time of an alien who's in custody when DHS requests that notice because they want to come in and take custody of that alien. And there have been about nine district court cases on this, and all but one of them out of Chicago have struck down the three conditions, saying that Congress had not authorized them as conditions on the burn grants. The third, there, there, there's been litigation over some state laws too. Judge Engelhardt already mentioned the Texas state law that attempted to limit some local sanctuary cities. The other state law I'm gonna flag for you is that California has some sanctuary laws that forbid uh, state employees to be cooperating with the feds, uh, but there's also a restriction in there that purports to limit California private employers from voluntarily, that is without a subpoena or legal process, cooperating with immigration enforcement agents to, give, to enter non-public areas or to look at employee records. Um, and the district court litigation on this so far has said, Unlikely that this is preempted, but found that a portion of this law, the portion that governs, that tells private employers they can't cooperate voluntarily with the feds, violated the doctrine of intergovernmental immunity. So this raises a series of questions that the panelists are going to get into. One of them is separation of powers. Can the president unilaterally add new conditions to federal grants? Can the president or, this or future presidents do this in other areas of law, environmental law, education, health law? guns, et cetera. There's also the issue that hasn't really been developed in the cases about whether the 8 U.S.C. 1373 itself is unconstitutional. There's this anti-commandeering doctrine in the federalism law in cases like Murphy versus NCAA and Prince, New York versus United States. Um, not really clear how this plays out in general. Some suggestion by some commentators, maybe even if anti-commandeering in general is right, maybe it's different when it comes to information sharing laws. There's a suggestion in one of the, the driver's license privacy cases about information maybe being different. There's a preemption debate out there about whether certain state statutes like the California law is preempted by federal law. And the Supreme Court in Arizona versus the United States took on one of these laws, but California's is a very different law. There's the spending clause. If the government is giving out money, under the burn grants, for example, the federal government's giving it out, how related does the condition have to be to the purpose of the grants for it not to violate cases like South Dakota versus Dole? Um, if, it, if it furthers the purpose of the program, more likely, but how far can it go from what is the core purpose and how do we know what the core purpose of the program is? Then there's this area of crimmigration that I identified where immigration is inter increasingly intertwined with criminal justice and should the, the federal government permit or encourage localities to control their own criminal justice priorities, to what extent does the federal government have a role in steering those priorities and both as a legal matter and then as a policy matter, how, what does that do to trust and cooperation among levels of government? And finally, we have this issue of the local laws where this is not just a federal state issue. In Texas, it's a state local issue as well. And there's not nearly as well developed law on what federalism looks like at the local and sublocal level. And I look forward to learning from the panelists about that. Professor Soman was next. And you can either address the audience from where you're seated or podium, whichever you prefer. Uh, might be easier to stand, uh, so be slightly less cramped. Sorry. So thanks to the Federalist Society for organizing this event and 
all of you for coming. And I suppose I should also thank the current administration for unintentionally helping to make federalism great again by losing a whole bunch of sanctuary cities cases in federal court. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm going to briefly talk about the federalism issues raised by these cases and why the administration has lost them. And at the end, I'll briefly touch on the policy questions surrounding sanctuary cities as well. Uh, so the basic story of the sanctuary cities cases, somewhat ironically, is that you have blue jurisdictions litigating against a Republican administration relying on federalism principles championed by conservative judges and legal scholars uh, against an administration which is championing a very broad view of national power which would override those principles if uh, the courts were to accept them, which so far at least they almost uniformly have refused to do so. Uh, most of these cases involve the issue of either the burn grant conditions or Trump's executive order from January 2017, both of which attach various immigration-related conditions to certain federal grants to state and local governments. Uh, and uniformly, uh, lower courts have ruled against them. There was that one district court decision that went the other way, but then that same judge actually reversed his decision at a preliminary injunction stage, and part of his decision he ruled in favor of the administration, but when it got to a final decision, he ruled the other way. And the basic reason why all these judges have ruled pretty much the same way, both conservative judges and liberal ones, is that only Congress has the power to attach conditions to federal grants, and when it does so, those conditions have to be clearly stated in the statute, and in this case, Congress never authorized those conditions, and they certainly were not clearly stated on the face of the statute, and that's pretty much what just about every federal court, both uh, district court decisions, but also now several court of appeal decisions, that's what they've concluded uh, about this set of policies. Uh, that at best the administration can try to rely on some very sort of vague language saying, well, they must uh, apply with, quote, applicable federal laws, but applicable federal laws can't mean any law of any kind uh, that might apply to state and local governments. If it did, uh, you could use similar language in other statutes to tie pretty much any grant to anything else that might be in a federal law somewhere. Uh, and of course, if that can be done in the area of sanctuary cities and immigration, it can be done in pretty much every other area of policy as well. As Judge Bebas mentioned, environmental law, education law, pretty much anything else. So even if you're comfortable with the Trump administration using this power to pressure and coerce state and local governments in the area of immigration, you might not be so happy if, for example, Elizabeth Warren becomes president and she gets to use the same power uh, in a wide range of other areas to promote more left of center uh, types of policies. Uh, these cases also raise some other spending power issues. In the case of the Trump executive order, uh, it also seems to apply to nearly all federal grants to state and local governments, uh, and that raises the issue of coercion, uh, that it would seem to put a gun to the head of the states and localities, uh, which is forbidden by uh, the Supreme Court's decision in NFIB versus Sebelius, another part of that decision that conservatives actually liked and championed. Uh, similarly, uh, when you have the conditions be this broad, uh, it might violate the requirement that conditions must be related to the purpose of the uh, original grant and several courts have ruled against the administration on that basis as well. Uh, these cases also raise the issue of commandeering, specifically with respect to Section 1373, which was mentioned by Judge Bibas in a series of decisions all uniformly supported by conservative justices or written by them as well, like Justice Scalia, the Supreme Court made clear that the federal government can't force states and localities to help enforce federal laws, even, by the way, in areas where the federal government does, in fact, have a clear power to enact the law in that area. A Section 1373 tries to circumvent that by saying, it's not that we're ordering you to turn over information, it's that we're ordering you not to instruct your subordinates to refuse refused to turn over the information, so it's sort of circuitous. Whether this was forbidden by anti-commandeering or not was, I admit, somewhat of a difficult question early on, but the question was cleared up by the Supreme Court's decision in NCAA versus Murphy, uh, which was a 7-2 decision joined by all five conservative justices, and that struck down a provision of a federal law uh, which forbade states and localities from, quote, 
authorizing sports gambling under their state laws, and the Supreme Court said it didn't matter that uh, it doesn't specifically require them to ban sports gambling, it just prevents them from authorizing. They said that's a distinction without a difference because it's still usurping control over state law, and exactly the same reasoning applies in Section 1373. It's still usurping the states and localities' control over their own employees, and that's why in the aftermath of NCAA versus Murphy, Every uh, district court and court of appeals which has considered this has either ruled that Murphy makes Section 1373 unconstitutional or that it requires Section 1373 to be interpreted so narrowly that it imposes little or no actual constraint on uh, the autonomy of state and local governments. Uh, and of course, this also has broader implications that go beyond immigration because if this sort of circumvention under Section 1373 is allowed, it could be used in a wide range of other policy areas, all those that were uh, mentioned earlier. Finally, a very brief word on the question of the policy issues surrounding sanctuary cities. Uh, the main accusation against them is that it, somehow if you have sanctuary cities, they increase crime. That is pretty much exactly the opposite of the truth. Uh, pretty much every study that has been done of this shows that the crime rate in sanctuary cities, controlling for other variables, is either unchanged as a result of sanctuary policies or it's actually lowered. If you're interested in this, there's a good literature review on this published just last year in the journal Sociology Compass. Uh, and there's good reasons why this wouldn't increase crime. One is uh, if, if state and local governments are using law enforcement resources to catch undocumented immigrants, that diverts those resources from actually combating violent and property crime. Also, police chiefs in jurisdictions which have large numbers of undocumented immigrants uh, and other immigrants, they uh, have long stated that uh, if they're forced to engage in uh, enforcing immigration law, that sows distrust of the community, makes minorities less likely to cooperate with the police, and does less likely to testify and provide evidence uh, in important cases. I would add that there's also large literature which indicates that immigrants in general, including undocumented immigrants, actually have have substantially lower crime rates than native-born Americans. So far from increasing the crime rate, they're actually lowering it uh, at the margin. There's yet another reason why it's good policy for states and localities to refuse to cooperate here, and that is the truly horrendous record uh, of abuse in ICE detention facilities. If you don't believe the testimony of the doctors and lawyers who have visited these facilities, try reading the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Inspector General reports on these matters. Uh, there's plenty of hair-raising material uh, just even in the DHS's own publication, uh, and it's understandable and a good thing if states and localities do not want to contribute uh, to such horrible abuses uh, or cooperate with agencies that engage in them. Uh, I look forward to the further discussion and to your questions. Thank you. All right, the next one to address us will be uh, former Attorney General Sessions. Thank you. It's great to, to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm such a fan of the Federalist Society. I've said previously that no interest organization advocating for certain values and principles has been more effective, I think, at least in the last 50 years, maybe ever, than the Federalist Society. And it's so helpful to the Department of Justice and President Trump to receive your advice and information on judges for nomination. And I think the president has, has done a, a greatest job maybe we've ever seen in appointing fabulous judges to the bench. So thank you all for that. <laughs> Look, the, um, the policy of the United States is to create a lawful system of immigration that allows immigration to occur in an effective way. I think I heard Ken Cuccinelli say yesterday that our 1.1 million people we, lit to, we allow to permanent residence in America every year is more than the next three countries in the world combined. We are a generous nation on immigration, but the American people believe that we should have a legal system that follows the law, 
the people aren't able just to wander in the country and be successful in doing so. President Trump campaigned on that. Well, I believe in the strong, the unified executive. As one leader of this government, it's the President of the United States. He campaigned on it. He said, I am going to build a wall. Uh, we're going to stop this illegality. And the people affirmed that in this past election. And I think that's good policy. That's correct policy. Surely we don't advocate illegal entry into the United States. So as a matter of, of policy, uh, let us say that there was at least bipartisan agreement under the Obama administration that people who entered the country illegally and then committed another crime in the United States should be deported. How simple is that? To reject that philosophy is to be clearly what some of our friends, even on the libertarian side, uh, believe in, which is open borders. And that is not a sustainable policy for the United States of America. And cities who say, you can come into our, our city or our county illegally, being subject to deportation under the law, which is indisputable, and then commit additional crimes in our city, uh, uh, we're not going to cooperate. And matter of fact, we're not going to even let our law enforcement officers cooperate with you. And so this is where the conflict arises. The federal government is not asking, is not asking people to go out and arrest illegal immigrants. What the federal government is saying is when you get a, you've arrested somebody in your jurisdiction and it's determined they're an illegal alien, that you should allow as a matter of comity and partnership the federal government to be able to interview them in jail and allow them, as we do throughout the country in every kind of crime, to place a detainer on them so that before they're released, you have a, 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 the ability to take them into custody. Now, I started in the 1970s as Assistant United States Attorney and in 12 years as United States Attorney. One of the greatest things that ever happened in law enforcement is this tremendous cooperative spirit we have today. I led it uh, when uh, President Reagan asked us to, to work to build teamwork between state and federal officials. Uh, this administration believes in it. When I traveled the state of the United States as Attorney General, I preached cooperative spirit by the tens of thousands, probably, on a daily basis. A person is arrested in one jurisdiction. Uh, another jurisdiction has charges against them. They place detainers on them. The, uh, the, uh, so when it says, basically, when you complete your processes uh, in your jurisdiction, we want to take them into custody because they owe accountability in our jurisdiction. That goes on every day. But radical city leaders have directed their police departments, contrary to the will of virtually every policeman in America, they've directed them to sec secrete, the, basically, the uh, arrestees, the illegal alien who's committed an additional crime, and even let them out the back door uh, so the federal people can't place a detainer or can't apprehend them. If you don't, as a practical matter, the the danger that places our officers are placed in and the time and effort and cost of trying to arrest somebody uh, in, a, in a sanctuary city like those in California who's been released and may be a dangerous criminal, may have been in, in custody for violent crimes, major drug dealers. Think about it. When you could pick the person up at, at jail and in a safe environment, conduct an interview of that person in jail. And the federal government provides assistance to state and local law enforcement every day in a whole lot of ways. And we, one of the reasons is to build this cooperative spirit to make each agency more productive and to protect the safety of the people uh, in the, uh, throughout the country. And, and it's a, a matter of federal interest that an alien who entered the country illegally and is a, conducts crime, commits crimes, it's a matter uh, that goes beyond the city. 
or the county, or the state even. It's a, and, and as you know, and has been noted, that immigration law is, federal government preempts it. Now we've got the Immigration Nationality Act, now is in two volumes. I think it's seven or 800 pages, inches thick. Why? It's designed to create a lawful system of immigration. That's what Congress wanted. And so now we have this massive attack in every possible way to undermine certain principles of, that have been understood over the years uh, to help us be effective in enforcing immigration law. They want to undermine that and, in fact, uh, have achieved a number of leap, loopholes, victories, a uh, number of court victories that have made it exceedingly difficult. Are you keeping time, Judge? <laughs> uh, you know, I was a senator. I could talk and when I was in the senator. The, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I just want to tell you, um, in my view, uh, this is no little matter. And I'm a resolute critic of these jurisdictions. It is absolutely indefensible, in my opinion. So we can't prove they've got these studies. Look. When we admit a legal immigrant, we should we, we want to seek somebody who's not a criminal. If they've got a criminal record, no, 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 you don't get in the United States as a citizen. We want honest people who uh, uh, obey the law and are going to be good citizens. We want to introduce drug dealers and uh, uh, smugglers and, and human trafficking people into the United States or people who had serious criminal charges in their own country. Why should we want to do that? We can't admit everybody. We get more applicants than we can admit. Let's admit 1.1 million people without crime. They don't have a right to demand entry into the United States of America. The immigration system of this country should serve the national interest. And in fact, when I was, took over the subcommittee on judiciary on immigration, I changed the name the immigration and the national interest. That's what I think the committee was about, should be about. Uh, so I wrap up, all right. Um, we're not commandeering the states. Uh, what we're saying is uh, that 1373 says that you should um, um, uh, not order your police department to be uncooperative. Uh, we'll challenge that. Maybe that, we'll see where the courts go with that. But I would say this about um, uh, criminal, criminals who are arrested. Department of Justice completed under the, a program study under the Obama administration of recidivism. They went, did a nine-year period, and they found that over uh, a period of nine years, 83% of the people who were convicted of crimes recidivated. It's set up under their protocols. It's not been talked about, but recidivism is a huge problem. And a, an education program, a job training program, a drug program does not guarantee that people won't recidivate. Many of these people had gone through those programs. And so if you have an illegal immigrant who violated that law, and comes in and commits another law, it's likely they'll commit more crimes in the future, over clearly. And so when we set priorities and enforce the law, that's the way it should, we should take that into effect. And it cannot be that a person who crosses the border of this country illegally and makes it 50 miles, 500 miles, can never be deported. So they're home free. All you got to do is, and you create this incentive, if you can get across the border, you're home free. So I suggest that is not a rational immigration policy. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. We will next hear from uh, Mark Fleming. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Fleming. I'm the Associate Director of Litigation at the National Immigrant Justice Center located in Chicago. 
NIJC provides legal representation to thousands of immigrants each year, which informs our policy work and our strategic litigation. I'd like to use my few minutes here to give you a kind of a brief background context to sanctuary laws. First, I'd like to cover changes in ICE's interior enforcement that gave rise to the current sanctuary laws. I was involved in some of the uh, guidance as far as the Chicago uh, sanctuary law back in 2011, so have been familiar in this area for some time. Second, I want to cover the basics of what a sanctuary law is and what it is not. And then finally, time permitting, some of the policy rationales that went into those sanctuary laws. So what are, what are these changes in ICE's enforcement that I'm talking about? Well, until recently, immigration officers generally conducted interior enforcement either on their own or they would assume custody of individuals at state or federal prisons. Individuals in state prisons have gone through the criminal process. They've been convicted of an offense, and an offense that led to a prison sentence, so typically a felony with a, a sentence of over one year. ICE has officers stationed at or present at all 4,300 state and federal prisons in the United States. This is true even in all quote unquote sanctuary jurisdictions. In 2008, ICE launched a new enforcement strategy called Secure Communities. ICE originally pitched this program as voluntary and that it was targeted only at individuals who had been convicted of serious offenses. At its, at its heart, Secure Communities is a fingerprint and data sharing program. Anytime local law enforcement sends an individual's fingerprints to the FBI for a criminal check, those fingerprints are book and booking information are shared automatically with ICE in real time for possible enforcement. ICE will then send an immigration detainer to that law enforcement agency requesting that they detain the person extra time after the person would otherwise be released so that ICE can assume custody. Many times these detainers are triggered at the point the person is posting bail or there's been a decision not to press charges. Thus, Secure Communities has moved ICE's enforcement to the front end of the criminal justice system, where, in, in, I, where it identifies individuals prior to any charges, any trial, or any conviction, conviction, thus sweeping up anyone who potentially has an encounter with police. As I mentioned, initially this program was voluntary. 42 states entered into memorandums of agreement to join the Secure Communities program, and in fact, you see the one here um, from the state of Illinois. And as you can see, the purpose of it was to con go after people convicted of serious criminal offenses. However, in, by May of 2011, Illinois sought to terminate its state MOA, citing serious concerns that the program was actually disproportionately targeting individuals with limited or no criminal record. In fact, by ICE's own statistics at that point, less than 20% of the individuals had been convicted of a serious offense. Instead of honoring Illinois' decision to opt out, ICE immediately made the program mandatory on the state. By August of 2011, as more states tried to opt out, citing similar concerns, ICE then unilaterally rescinded all 42 MOAs and made the program mandatory on all states. As a result, law enforcement nationwide is required to this day to contribute with immigration enforcement if they want access to the FBI criminal database. To give you a sense of the scope of secure communities, from October 2008 until February 2015 when ICE just stopped publishing the data, the FBI had shared 47 million fingerprints and background checks, biographical information, to, to ICE. At this point, it's likely over 100 million. I'd also flag that disproportionately, these are US citizens' fingerprints and booking information that's being sent there. We still don't know if ICE is storing those fingerprints and whether they are sharing them with other jurisdictions. And so the, you, you've heard a bit of this discussion about 8 USC 1373, which is important. But this information is being shared. It's commandeered 
through secure communities, even now in all sanctuary jurisdictions. ICE is alerted in real time of every single arrest in the United States, the person's name, their address, and any other information that's gathered during booking. This radically transformed local officers' relationships to their community, because in effect, they're now frontline immigration agents. It's this commandeering of local police that these sanctuary laws were sought to ameliorate. So what are, what are some of the common components of a sanctuary law and what, what aren't sanctuary laws? Um, they can vary quite a bit. They're not all cookie cutter. Um, but here are some of the common components. One, that local law enforcement's not gonna inquire about immigration status. Two, that local law enforcement's not gonna hold someone extra time after they would otherwise be released like any other person in state or local custody. And in fact, in most states, there is no authority to hold people for civil immigration arrest. And ICE has conceded repeatedly in litigation that when sending the, the detainer request, it is not providing legal authority for them to hold it, the person. Third, some limit access to individuals in local jails regarding interviews and transfers. Now, the, the circumstances of those can vary quite a bit, and I'm happy to get into those in the Q&A. Um, fourth, some prohibit communicating an individual's release and contact information. And then finally, exceptions. Uh, there are a lot of exceptions for certain individuals with criminal charges, convictions, or that they're listed in a terrorism and gang database. Notably, the Chicago Ordinance and the California law that was cited by Attorney General have myriad exceptions, substantial exceptions. In fact, I had three slides of eight-point font of all the exceptions in the California law that I just pulled out. So what, what aren't sanctuary laws? Sanctuary laws don't block ICE from conducting its own enforcement. ICE and CBP's budget is 35% larger than the FBI, ATF, DEA, Secret Service, and U.S. Marshals combined. ICE and CBP, 35% more than the five largest criminal uh, federal agencies. They can do their own enforcement. Sanctuary laws currently don't prevent notification and transfers from state prisons. I mentioned the secure community's fingerprint sharing. And they do not limit cooperation on ICE criminal warrants. So there was a discussion about detainers uh, between federal agencies and state agencies sharing. That's under the interstate detainer agreement, which ICE detainers aren't a part of and they have a criminal warrant behind them. There's nothing in these sanctuary laws that prevent cooperation on criminal warrants. And then finally, just a couple of the rationales for these. State and local, law, state and lo, ugh, state and local officials should determine how to keep their community safe. They're the ones that are accountable to the local community. They should make the decisions. The, as, as the professor mentioned, the major cities' chiefs have for over a decade across the Bush, the Obama, and the Trump administrations have said that entanglement with immigration undermines our ability to protect our communities. We should listen to the chiefs. Second, we want to ensure that all residents can con contact the police without fear. The available survey empirical evidence shows that crime reporting goes down when they fear their lo that they may be subject to immigration enforcement. Third, we don't want to ensure, as, as an immigrant advocate, I want to ensure that families aren't torn apart due to just an encounter with local police. If they get convicted of a serious crime, of course, immigration enforcement may be part of it on the back end after the conviction. But there are over 5 million US citizen children that have an undocumented parent. If a parent is deported, they're gone forever. There is no pathway back. Finally, the available empirical evidence shows that secure communities just doesn't work. The Journal of Law and, uh, and Economics at, at Chicago, the dean of the Chicago Law School, concluded that this program does not work. And that uh, sanctuary laws do not increase the rate of crime. And so I, I will stop there, um, and I look forward to your questions. I 
excuse me, you want to do it from sit sitting down if you use that gate? Yeah, no, way. that's no good here. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't, didn't want to be deprived of anything to say. Um, very happy to be here at, at, uh, on this uh, distinguished panel and addressing such a distinguished gathering. Uh, there seems to be a good chance that soon sanctuary cities and policies to a large extent won't be up for debate anymore, or at least the debate won't have much point. That's because of the case USA versus California, in which the Justice Department, under Attorney General Jeff Sessions, sued California over its sanctuary state law. The case is now at the cert petition stage. If cert is granted and the Supreme Court rules in favor of the United States, sanctuary laws to a great extent and policies will be invalidated all over the country. A centerpiece of California's sanctuary state law, SB 54, is that state and local law enforcement officers are prohibited from cooperating with ICE. For example, by informing ICE when asked when a given criminal alien will be released from custody uh, for his crime, or transferring custody of a criminal alien to ICE, or even giving, giving ICE a criminal alien's personal information, such as an address. The United States argues that these features of the laws are preempted because they constitute obstacles to the congressional purpose that immigration laws be enforced and that criminal aliens be deported after their release from custody. According to the Supreme Court, state laws that stand as obstacles to the full accomplishment of Congress's purpose in a federal law violate the Supremacy Clause and are preempted. I would add that this doctrine seems originalist and textualist to me. What kind of supremacy would it be if states were free to thwart Congress's will with every sort of stratagem they could come up with, and of, and of course the kinds of maneuvers states could and would use would be infinite in their variety. If the results Congress was trying to achieve in its laws could be blocked at every turn by states that didn't want those results, Federal law would be supreme in name only, and the state laws that blocked or interfered with federal laws would be to the contrary of the latter within a reasonable meaning of that phrase in the Supremacy Clause. As Chief Justice Marshall wrote, it is of the very essence of supremacy to remove all obstacles to its action within its own sphere, and so to modify every power invested in subordinate governments as to exempt its own operations from their influence. In USA versus California, the Ninth Circuit panel wrote a remarkable opinion. All the more useful because en banc review was denied and this opinion will go to the Supreme Court. In it, the Ninth Circuit acknowledged that California's sanctuary law makes ICE's job more difficult. They could hardly have avoided making that acknowledgement. ICE can hardly stake out every jail in California, waiting for criminal aliens to be released or hunt them down later when local officers are even pro prohibited from giving ICE their contact information. To use Marshall's phrase, SB 54 influences ICE's operations and very much to the, de to the detriment of those operations. So why is it not an obstacle? One reason the Ninth Circuit gave was the Tenth Amendment. The federal government can't commandeer the states by telling state legislatures what to do or by telling state officers to administer a federal program. Of course, there's no commandeering here. No federal law tells state officers to cooperate with ICE. But there's the specter of the commandeering doctrine, the Ninth Circuit explained. If Congress had told state officers to cooperate, that would have been commandeering and it would have violated the Tenth Amendment. And that means courts can't complete the obstacle preemption equation in this instance. The specter of commandeering scares them off. But perhaps sensing that a mere metaphor was not enough to explain its decision, the panel mo moved on to another tack. It agreed with the district court when it said that when California stands aside from cooperation, that is not interfering. Indeed, you might say, standing aside is the very opposite of interfering. In, 
It's just refusing to be involved, either to interfere or to assist. So, rather than saying that California's law is an obstacle but not preempted because of the specter of commandeering, the panel here says that California's law is not an obstacle after all. It's just California standing aside. This is mere sophistry, of course. In SB 54, California doesn't stand aside. It affirmatively commands state officers who would otherwise cooperate with ICE not to cooperate. If California had really wanted to stand aside, it would have passed no law either to command cooperation or to prohibit it. The Ninth Circuit also gestures at the presumption against preemption. A state, of course, generally has power to control its officers, particularly in the area of criminal law enforcement. That does not mean, though, that states traditionally have the power to control or influence what happens to criminal aliens after they have served their state sentences. That is centrally and paradigmatically a federal concern. It is a part of having a unified national foreign policy. It is squarely within the federal plenary power over immigration. So if a state law interferes with Congress's purposes in that area, even if that state law enjoys any presumption against preemption, that presumption is readily overcome given the overriding federal interests here. I would like to conclude with my own understanding of how the Tenth Amendment reserves power to the states and invite anyone who disagrees to correct me. It seems to me, just reading the text, that you first have to look at whether a power is delegated to the United States in the Constitution or prohibited to the states in the Constitution before you can decide whether it is reserved to the states. And by power, I think the Tenth Amendment means the power to make a particular kind of law uh, not the power to levitate or to fly to Mars. So I don't quite see how the Tenth Amendment could ever block preemption from going forward as the Ninth Circuit said happened here. If a law is preempted, the power to make that law is prohibited to the states by the Supremacy Clause, is it not? And in that case, the Tenth Amendment by its terms doesn't reserve that power to the states. Perhaps something can be done with the presumption against preemption in cases other than this one. But beyond that, it seems to me that the Ninth Circuit's move, admitting that SB4 is an obstacle, but saying it's not in violation of the Constitution because of the Tenth Amendment, can never work. If a law is an obstacle, it is obstacle preempted, and the power to make it is prohibited to the states by the Constitution, and thus isn't reserved to the states in the Tenth Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, appreciate all of the remarks that have been made. Uh, we will now go into a series of questions for our panel. Uh, I, I'd like the panelists to stay in their seats if they would to answer so that we can go quicker. Also, if you can keep your answers as short as possible, uh, we'll allow each panelist who wants to add to an answer or respond to do so. And of course, you don't have to respond if you, something's already been said, but if you'd like to add something, you'll certainly be given that chance. Uh, let me ask Mark first. Mark, you had uh, submitted to me a question or two that you would like to propound to a fellow panelist. So would you like to go ahead and begin? Uh, sure. Um, so one question I had uh, for the Attorney General. Um, if public safety is one of the concerns or one of the principal concerns with sanctuary laws, why as a policy matter was the strategy to strip state and local law enforcement of millions of dollars through the burn jag grants in order to gain pressure or coerce them into complying with or, or giving up on their sanctuary laws why why would we target millions of dollars of law enforcement money um, in order to promote public safety the one of the great achievements in modern law enforcement is um, cooperativeness um, Every day, detainers, holes are placed on, on people from one jurisdiction. Uh, they place it on another one where a person is apprehended and held in custody. Uh, without that, it's, it would be a monumental degradation of it. So it's not up to the jurisdiction who has a prisoner when they receive a hold 
to litigate the validity of the charge in the other jurisdiction. That's not a practical thing to do. And so what the cities apparently are doing, the sanctuary cities, they're saying, yes, uh, we know we honor holes and detainers, but uh, we don't like your law, so we're not going to honor it. Whether or not they have the legal basis to do so uh, it is a very detrimental attack on the legal duty of ICE officers to enforce immigration law. It, it degradates their ability to be successful. Instead of picking up, one officer can go and pick up a person from a prison, but if they have to make an arrest in some area of the city, they may take five officers. They may not find the person. They may hours. It's a monumental practical problem for them. So I think that uh, if they don't cooperate, then why should the federal government provide additional funding to their own budget? And with regard to the COPS program, uh, we play, recommended and, and uh, put in our grant proposals, which is the, helps hire police and all, extra points if you're cooperative with the duties of the federal government in enforcing immigration. And that one has been held up, upheld by the Ninth Circuit. Uh, so uh, how it will all work out and you know, how the Supreme Court will see 1373, I don't know. But the president believes sanctuary cities is not good. He believes that pretty strongly. And so did I. And so uh, I saw, uh, I thought it was appropriate, and the president uh, does, to say that if you don't cooperate, you don't receive the money. Anybody else want to comment on this? Well, I would just say briefly? that, and uh, we targeted it only to direct law enforcement. We didn't say highway funds can't be denied or Medicaid or something beyond that. It, uh, efforts were made by our lawyers to uh, focus it on appropriate uh, financing uh, uh, grants. Okay. Anybody else want to briefly comment? Yes, yeah, Professor so I think Selman. There's a deep contradiction here in the administration's position. On the one hand, they want to say we're the enforcers of law and order, but at the same time, they're being lawless themselves in the way that they go about it. They're ignoring basic constitutional constraints on how the executive is not allowed to attach new conditions to federal grants, uh, including law enforcement grants. And in the case of the executive order issued in January of 2017, it's not, in fact, limited to law enforcement grants. There's no such limitation stated in the text of the order. After the fact, Justice Department lawyers said, well, you should try to read in such a limitation, but it's not in the order itself, and the courts have refused to read in this sort of post hoc uh, constraint. And the same goes, I think, with commandeering, that if their arguments here are accepted about uh, the idea that if they demand cooperation, uh, that's not commandeering, it's just obstacle preemption or something, then uh, that would completely destroy the anti-commandeering doctrine, because by the same logic which says that it makes ICE's job harder if well, state and local governments don't help them, you can say the same thing with pretty much every other federal law. You can say in every other area that if state and local law enforcement doesn't help out, it makes it at the margin more difficult for the federal government to enforce the laws. Uh, as it wants, that would require reversing the Prince decision where states refuse to, or some states refuse to help enforce federal gun control laws. It would essentially uh, gut the entire uh, anti-commandeering doctrine of the same logic uh, is applicable everywhere else. Uh, I, I had so, a question for you about sure. the Prince decision, but yes. I think you just covered it. Um, go ahead and finish up. No, I'm, I'm done. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, well, let me, let me, I think you just answered the question I was going to ask. Does anybody else want to respond to the question that Mark has well, on the floor? Well, I'll just say this. The legislation that created the grant programs for COPS and burn grants provide authority for the Department of Justice to put certain conditions on it. And we think we put reasonable conditions on it. The court will decide, I suppose. No but uh, we thought uh, there is language in the uh, uh, laws that created the grant program that allow that kind of activity. Chris, you look like you were oh, I think wanting I, to jump in here. I would just say that uh, 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 the laws that preempt SB 54 are not uh, commandeering laws. They don't tell state officers what to do. They don't tell states what to do. The laws in Prince did said that uh, state officers had to do background checks. Um, if New York had told state officers, you can't do background checks uh, for the federal government, 
uh, that would be an analogous situation. And it's an interesting analogy to think about. I'm kind of curious. Uh, we, a couple of you made some references to, uh, we've talked about federalism, we've talked about commandeering, uh, but it seems to me, and I'll get your responses to it, it seems to me there's a big difference between uh, the relationship between the federal government and statutory authority as per the states and compared to the situation that I started out with where you have a locality and a state trying to impose on a locality compliance with federal law. Uh, seems to me there's a difference that would tend to defeat arguments based on commandeering or or federal, does anybody want to comment yeah. on that? And by the way, before we get answers, if any of you have questions, if you could make your way to one of the microphones, we'll try to take those. I know we have an event this evening, and so we'll try to break straight up at five o'clock, but I, I, we do want to take some of your questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So here, I think I largely agree with you. There is a difference. The federal constitution constrains what the federal government can do to states, but it imposes very few, if any, constraints on what states can do to their own localities. Some state constitutions do that. I don't know enough about the Texas constitution to say what's true in that case, but it does present a very different kind of an issue uh, from a federal constitutional point of view. In my view, uh, it is perhaps a mistake that the federal constitution doesn't give local localities more autonomy than it does, but that is the way it's structured. Well, I understand it, uh, at least in Alabama, cities and counties are creatures of the state, and the state law dominates over any local policy. Okay. And in addition, as you said, Judge, once a state is, uh, has established such a law, I think it weakens some of these other arguments that have been raised. Anybody else want to? Uh, the only thing I would comment is is that, yeah, the home rule, they're called home rule laws uh, at the state level, and they, they do vary quite a bit from state to state as to what control the state legislator, legislatures have over local uh, communities. The only other one comment I wanted to make with respect to the burn jag litigation, there has been 10 lawsuits, and the, d the Department of Justice is lost in all 10, um, and they are before a lot of conservative judges and liberal judges. It's a wide mix of the bench, and they have been uniform as to the burn jag, as to that the conditions that are, are not lawful. Can okay. I make one small point? And at the most recent of these decisions, yes, it's from the Ninth Circuit, but it was joined by uh, Judge Jay Bybee, who's one of the most conservative judges in the entire federal judiciary and also known for his support of broad executive power in a lot of areas. If your argument about executive power is so overreaching that you can't convince Judge Bybee, then uh, maybe you have some homework so you may want to rethink your approach. <laughs> well, let's do this. Uh, we'll start at this microphone. If you want to address your question to a particular panelist, uh, you please do, but we will let other panelists respond, and if you all can respond briefly, we can take more questions. So we'll start here, and then we'll come to this microphone, and I'm trying to see with that light, or whether, is there another microphone in the back? Just two. Two, okay, great. All right, well then we'll start with this one here. Sir, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Sure, so uh, let me direct it to the panel as a whole. Would it be legal for, const and I don't know the answer to this, would it be legal for California to write a law that says we disagree with Georgia's laws or Georgia's law enforcement system, we will honor no detainers from the state of Georgia, but we will honor detainers from all other states? And, and if that is, is not constitutional, then how is this different? I would say that may be. Um, constitutional, but I would say that uh, it would be a monumental breach of comity of uh, such extraordinary impact that it would be uh, unthinkable that a state would do that. Secondly, um, uh, the federal government shouldn't subsidize such behavior. Mark, did you want I would to say that the, what, what, let, let me let Mark respond, and then we'll, I'll get to you, Chris. Okay, let me get to Mark first, and then we'll take over the, here. There's a, there's a critical difference here between criminal detainers and immigration detainers. There's, there is an interstate compact, a compact between the federal government and each of the states called the Interstate Agreement on Detainers, or the Interstate Detainer Agreement, in which that is what controls the authority, uh, to your question, about 
can I say, Georgia, we're not going to honor. What's critically different here is this immigration is not part of that detainer agreement. And so it falls completely outside of any sort of responsibilities. That interstate detainer agreement is what binds the, the requirement to honor other states' uh, detainers, which are backed by criminal warrants, uh, actual probable cause finding, et cetera. Um, that uh, gets attached to it, and thus, in fact, there are supreme. There are cases on this where, um, because of the interstate detainer agreement, you cannot, unless you step out of that agreement, um, just ignore another state's or the federal government's criminal detainers. And that's why criminal warrants of the immigration uh, and customs enforcement have to be honored because of the interstate detainer agreement. But okay. these are not criminal warrants or criminal detainers. Okay, Chris. And then uh, we'll I would just say that, that there's no uh, Georgia supremacy clause in the Constitution. So. <laughs> okay. So, All right. I, I, I actually, I agree it would not be unconstitutional. In many cases, it would be a bad idea if you uh, boycott another state entirely. However, if in certain particular areas of their criminal law or other law, a state had a history of abuse comparable in scale to uh, ICE's history of abuse, then it might be entirely justifiable and desirable for other states to refuse to turn over uh, fugitives to that state. And indeed, during the era of slavery and Jim Crow, when some southern states did have abuses like this, sometimes there were cases where uh, northern states are in the uh, anti bellum era free states uh, refused to turn people over to them, and I think often there was good reason for doing that. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of things where states cooperate with each other or cooperate with the federal government where they do so voluntarily, and it may be a good idea to do so, doesn't mean that they're constitutionally required. Thank judge, you. And judge, I'm not ignoring you, but I know you're somewhat <laughs> limited in what you can say, as am I. Uh, <laughs> so, so if ever you want to chime in, please do. Don't take offense to the fact that I'm, you, that I'm not you looking your cringe. way. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's take a question here. Sure, I'll direct this at uh, Attorney General Sessions, but anyone can, can chime in as well. I wanted to ask about the problem of, uh, you know, how easy it's become for to find a district court judge who will issue a national injunction against virtually every attempt at controlling illegal immigration, be it through regulation or executive order. Um, you know, I'm not saying that every, every order should be upheld either, but it's almost 100% guaranteed that, you know, a new, a new order or rule will be, will be uh, enjoined and, and, you know, courts aren't going to be much help because you know, it's usually to appeal to the Ninth Circuit. The Supreme Court take, can't take all these. Um, you know, so what, what are we to do given this, uh, you know, the willingness of, of uh, again, the courts to enjoin everything Trump does and this seemingly new standard under the Administrative Procedures Act, you know, in which it's gone from being, you know, uh, an APA challenge has gone from being a long shot to, uh, you well, know, let, let's, a good let's bet. Limit, I don't mean to interrupt you, but your question originally related to the nationwide injunction. Yeah, I'd, what are we to do about the fact that it seems hopeless okay. uh, to ever do anything about illegal immigration if everything's going to be enjoined? Okay. So let's, what what is a president to do? Let's address that one. Okay, um, thank you. The department's litigating position um, is impacted. Uh, at least the perception of it by the uh, media. So when the, the travel order was issued by the president right after he took office called the so-called travel ban, um, judges all over the country issued nationwide injunctions. It's unenforceable. And we uh, had a big conference and I thought it was perfectly lawful under the powers given to the president to protect the uh, safety of, of the United States. And so we filed an emergency appeal with the Supreme Court. It took that. And all the lawyers said, we don't, you know, this is, you don't do this often. You know, you can't do this every day. We said we did it. And of course, about 90% of, of that president's order was upheld. And I think the rest of it will when final. So they struck down that. Also, we had a judge in Chicago on, on one of, on the, um, grant, one of the grant programs, I forgot which, and he issued a nationwide injunction. But Chicago is, I think one of the speakers said, all these sanctuary city policies are different. 
what was before his court didn't apply to New Orleans or Montgomery County, Maryland, or Berkeley, or all these other cases. It was very improper for a single sitting district judge, 600 in the country, to just strike down an entire law. And that was either he backed down and after two Supreme Court justices questioned the uh, sanctuary of uh, the nationwide injunction policies, uh, or he, uh, or the Court of Appeals uh, blocked it. I Professor Selman, did you yeah. So I would say a couple of things about the nationwide injunction question, which obviously is a question that goes far beyond this particular area of law. One is uh, liberals challenging the Trump administration were not the first to get nationwide injunctions in an immigration case. When conservative states challenged the Obama administration in the DAPA uh, case, they sought and got such an injunction. And in my view, although I disagreed with their legal arguments, if their substantive arguments were correct, then it could also follow that they deserve the nationwide injunction. I think the same is true in some of these cases against the Trump administration as well. If the legal problem with the administration policy is one that doesn't vary based on facts that diverge in particular areas, but rather it's just a general problem that applies everywhere, such as that uh, they're trying to impose conditions that weren't authorized by Congress, then I think a nationwide injunction is entirely appropriate. But I would add finally that in this particular area, it's simply not the case there's some unusual outlier judge, you know, sitting somewhere out in a weird position or something doing this. They've lost these cases pretty uniformly with judges with a wide range of views and ideologies. Uh, so I think uh, if a nationwide injunction is ever appropriate at all, I think it is appropriate in these kinds of cases which are not local context dependent, but rather are dependent on more fundamental questions like is this commandeering, was this condition authorized by Congress. I do recognize there are principal arguments which I say nationwide injunctions are always unconstitutional. I don't have the time to address that now, but there was a great panel on this uh, by the Federalist Society, I think, last year, and I urge people to watch the video of that if they're interested. Yeah, I was, by the way, I wasn't focusing on the national part, just the fact that it's almost 100% assured that you can get any Trump order on, on immigration and join. The best, the best design system depends on its personnel. I would say also oh. that um, it's beginning more and more difficult for the executive branch to carry out its duties. The executive branch is empowered to handle immigration law, but brilliant uh, lawyers with theories, like my friend over here, uh, <laughs> attack all of this, and uh, the individual statutes that become critical aren't, aren't interpreted sufficiently, in my view, in accord with the overall intent of the act. The overall intent of the act is to have a lawful system of immigration. So now we're at a point uh, where we're going to have to go to the Congress and to fix some of these problems because it is unenforceable in many ways if we can't fix them. We, don't, we, we basically have a lawless system that's protected by a system that's supposed to block lawlessness. Let, let me ask, Mark, did you have anything on this topic? Uh, the, the one thing I would add as the Chicago case, uh, it was before Judge Leinenweber, who is a, a Reagan appointee, um, one of the probably more conservative on the district court that issued the nationwide injunction. Uh, the, he, so he enjoined first the 2017 uh, conditions. Uh, DOJ turned around and put a bow on them and issued the exact same conditions in 2018, which brought it back to the same judge. And so not only is it uniform across, as, as the professor mentioned, but also they, they brought back the exact same conditions to the exact same judge. Hmm. Um, okay. And so there was reason for a, a stronger injunction. OK. Well, let's get to the next question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I have appreciated the discussion, a uh, very learned and articulate discussion about uh, illegal immigration. I have a more practical question and I would welcome the response of any panel member. Do the rights of illegal aliens exceed or are they superior to the rights of natural born citizens? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. 
Is there a, a uniform answer, or was there no. some dissent I'll, on the I'll, panel, I'll, or I'll, 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 an opinion I'll, of? I'll give a uniform answer, which is that structural constraints on federal power that are in the Constitution apply to immigration policy just like they do to every other area of federal policy. And it doesn't matter whether it's dealing with illegal aliens or something else, still those constraints should be respected. And by the way, also, there are lots of constitutional rights that apply irrespective of whether a person is a citizen or not, irrespective of whether they're uh, an illegal immigrant and so forth. There are some constitutional rights which indeed are reserved for citizens, but most are not. Uh, okay. Caution, that, that uh, may be an innovative opinion. Uh, it's one held by people like James Madison and others. So if, if he was an innovator, I'm, I'm happy to be. You played the Madison card. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, if not, we'll go ahead to the next question. Sure. General Sessions pointed out earlier that the statute actually confers on the Attorney General, at least for some grants, uh, the ability to add conditions. Uh, that creates an interesting non-delegation problem. If, if those conditions were imposed directly by Congress, would you think it would be valid? And then uh, uh, se uh, second, uh, I just want to thank Attorney General Sessions for your service. Uh, you did a tremendous job, and I think we all owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you. So the question pertains to conditions that are placed and whether they would, if they were placed by Congress, uh, would that make a difference? If I'm distilling your question down even further. Yes. I, yes. That's what Congress, all the grant programs are conditioned or, or everybody would be eligible for everything. So I, uh, and, 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 and I think there's some, I knew you can criticize the uh, delegation to, to the Department of Justice uh, powers, but it's done every day in all kinds of grant programs. And um, so I, I think that Congress gave the department the power to do this. We'll see what the courts ultimately hold. Yeah. I wonder if I could comment on the first part of it. I think if this was specifically uh, authorized by Congress, that would of course remove what has been the main objection in many of these cases, which is that it wasn't authorized by Congress, but in some cases there have been other issues such as coercion in the January 2017 executive order, at least the way it's phrased, it seems to apply to virtually all federal grant to state and local governments. That's exactly what is forbidden in the NFIB versus Sebelius decision where it was authorized by Congress, but the Supreme Court said you can't hold a gun to the head of the state governments. Uh, in some cases also there are issues about whether immigration enforcement is sufficiently related to the uh, lo lo traditional local law enforcement purposes of the Byrne Grant and in the district court decision in Philadelphia, they ruled that it was not. I think what is or is not related is a kind of a difficult issue. So uh, in the hypothetical universe where all this was properly authorized by Congress and they narrowed it down enough that it wasn't coercive, then we might face some difficult questions about exactly where relatedness begins and where it ends. And frankly, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on this is not a model of clarity. Okay. Let's see if we can take a couple more, at least a couple more, before the 5 o'clock hour. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, panel. Uh, first of all, I also wanted to salute the Attorney General. Thank you, Attorney General Sessions, for your strong stance, and I feel, in my opinion, a proper stance on this issue and the strength of your character in this issue. So again, thank you very much for your job as Attorney General. I'm, I'm a city attorney in Danbury, Connecticut, and I've dealt with sanctuary city issues since the famous case, the Danbury 11 case, you can look it up on Google, in 2006, where the police, <coughs> police in Danbury cooperated with FBI officials and got tagged for it a few years later and had to pay half a million dollars to several illegal alien workers as a result of what, again, the courts felt was inappropriate combination. But the reason I bring that up is because I swear in a lot of officers and other officials, including political officials in the city, and every time they raise their hands, right hands, to take the oath, they always swear an oath to the laws of the jurisdiction and the laws of the United States. And the police officers, at least in Danbury, felt strong enough where they were upholding the laws of the jurisdiction and of the United States. So I guess my question is, at the federal level, when federal officials, uh, anybody, 
holds up their hands and swears uh, allegiance to the federal laws and laws of the United States, aren't they violating that oath when they allow state laws to supersede those federal laws? Anybody wish to respond to that? The laws of the United States include constitutional limitations on federal power. Uh, and among those limitations is limitations on the ability of the federal government to pressure state governments and use them in effect to help enforce federal law. So far from violating the oath, actually the individuals in question when they refuse to help the federal government when uh, their state governments tell them not to do so, they're actually upholding the Constitution by upholding the Constitution's important limitations on federal power, uh, which are part of what makes it possible for us to have a diverse nation with many issues left to state governments rather than the federal government, and part of it also imposes political accountability on the federal government in that it can't just offload enforcement of its own laws onto the states uh, when the states feel that it's not in their interest to cooperate. It then either has to persuade them otherwise or it has to allocate its own resources to enforce its own laws. We have a few more minutes. Let's see if we can get these last two questions in. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I would ask about the, the public safety element of these sanctuary city policies. Generally, I'd ask the panelists when citing two studies about the relationship between crime and migration uh, to qualify a little bit their citations because case by case, some of these studies make findings that are actually counterproductive to the pro-sanctuary cities argument, such as studies that conflate lawful and unlawful migrants. And one study in particular hypothesized that the reason a jurisdiction could see a drop in crime is because it responds to an influx of illegal migration by putting more police officers on the street. And so my question is whether the panelists who favor sanctuary cities have noticed anywhere any particular example of a policy under the sanctuary city umbrella that maybe you would concede is counterproductive to the goal of public safety, such as, for example, policies where a municipality will pay for pro bono legal representation to an alien who is also a convicted criminal to avoid his deportation, or when district attorneys downplead crimes for aliens that they would enforce more strictly against citizens, specifically because they don't want these aliens to be deported, okay. or when I, I states don't mean change. To cut you, I don't mean to cut you off, but I yeah, think, yeah, I just I think to we get with some examples. I, I think all. we have the question. We'll go ahead and answer that one as quickly Thank you for as considering we can, it. and we'll get to the last question. Go ahead. So. I, can't, I don't have time in this short period that we have to review every study out there, but I will simply mention that there's a pretty broad consensus here among uh, academic experts that even the best studies that do separate out legal and illegal, I do recognize the need to do that. Uh, they come to the same sorts of conclusions that uh, law enforcement re uh, resources are better directed directly to fight violent property and other crimes uh, than to trying to deport undocumented immigrants. Uh, if you're interested, there's a literature review just last year in the journal Criminology, which is one of the leading journals uh, in this field, uh, as to are there particular policies which may you know, have counterproductive effects. Again, I can't review every single policy that's out there. I think at least generally speaking, the core policy of denying uh, state and local cooperation to ICE and other similar federal agencies, uh, the standard finding on that is either it has little or no effect on crime or it actually has a beneficial effect because of the issue of cooperation uh, of uh, immigrant communities with law enforcement. If, if the cities do respond by putting more police on the street, that might actually be a good thing because lots of studies do show that when you put more police on the street and they're devoted to traditional crime fighting uh, rather than to deportation, that does reduce crime. So, Professor, let me, let me get one, sure. whoever else wants to comment on this one and we'll get sure. this last one in of very course. quickly. Sorry to interrupt. I, I apologize. That's all right. That's all right. I consider it. Um, incomprehensible that if we have an 80 percent recidivism rate and you have an illegal alien who commits a crime in the United States when that individual is deported that crime there will be less crime than otherwise would be the case I mean what planet are we on what I don't think the numbers are huge I'm not saying that it's huge but that can be no doubt in my mind that if you have a uh, uh, that, that uh, these individuals uh, present risk, many of them violent risk, drug dealing risk, and other things that if they're removed, you'll have less crime. 
Let's take the. I, I would say the University of Arizona study showed that uh, the illegal aliens represent a higher percentage of the population than they represent in the state based on non immigration offenses. Um, and also, people who are illegal immigrants who are convicted for serious crimes are usually sent back to their country earlier than a normal person would just to get them out of the jail. Uh, so let me let uh, a lot of reasons. I don't about mean that. to interrupt you, but um, Mark, you want to respond? Yeah, let's just take this last question. L last year in removal proceedings, only 3% of cases included a criminal ground of removability. 3%. And the, the bar is fairly low after the 1996 laws. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Vishru Chalat. I'm with 3L from Vermont Law School. Um, Mike, I'm going to make this very brief. I know that we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, given the fact that uh, states have different standards on their immigration policies, with Arizona being on the extreme conservative end and California being on the extreme liberal end of, of the policies, uh, and also given the fact that uh, you know, many uh, immigrants who commit uh, high crimes such as the drug trade tend to have an effect on interstate commerce. You know, they distribute their drugs across different states. My question to you is, uh, shouldn't field preemption apply in this case? Shouldn't the federal government have the authority to regulate illegal immigration simply because uh, the illegal crimes affect uh, multiple states? And if states don't share information uh, to the federal government, um, they're effectively uh, endangering other states uh, whose you know, where the immigrants may cross into their borders. So from a policy perspective, isn't it prudent to uh, share information to the federal government? And of course, and then you can uh, debate whether uh, the federal government has a right to arrest someone. But okay. as far as the information uh, sharing perspective is concerned, that's, okay. that's what I wanted to ask. Chris, did you want to, Professor, you want to? Yeah. Okay. So just very briefly, even if this is wise from a policy point of view, it doesn't follow that it's constitutional, uh, but I think it's unwise even from a policy point of view if information sharing actually detracts from effective law enforcement of uh, laws against violent crime, which it does, and to the extent that it contributes to war on drugs, this is actually a whole other discussion, but I think it's really the war on drugs itself which is causing harms across state lines and should be gotten rid of and promoting organized crime and the like, so from a policy perspective to the extent that this information sharing might reinforce the war on drugs, that doesn't strike me as a good idea. I would add further, if you accept the argument the federal government can interfere anywhere where there might be some cross-border effects, that is another argument that would essentially collapse uh, virtually any constitutional restrictions on federal power, because you can almost always argue almost anything, if it happens often enough, will have some effect on uh, other states. Okay, anybody else want to wrap up this last question? Just, um, Any addition? None of this, none of what we're talking about with sanctuary laws impact cooperation on criminal matters. So as to communication, none of this impacts that. This is, this is, this is purely in the non-criminal context. And as I pointed out, cooperation on criminal warrants or sharing of information, joint task force happen everywhere um, for criminal matters. I, I would just say that the federal government already has uh, <clears throat> plenary power over immigration. And the, the concerns you raise is one of, are one of the reasons why. Um, and, and that when states pass laws meant to uh, make federal law enforcement and immigration less effective, uh, those laws are preempted. Okay. Um, well, I want to thank all, the, all of our panelists here. If you all could give them a round of applause. <laughs>